Hey, welcome everybody. I'm Ed Friedman, Chairman of Friends of Merrimini Bay. Um, um, hopefully some of you are here for the first time and I'm sure a lot of you are here uh, as per usual. So I'm gonna just talk a little bit about Friends of Merrimini Bay before introducing our speaker. Um, so thank Martin McDonough, our, one of our web volunteers who sort of deals with this part of the web. And of course, our speaker. So um, yeah, we're a unique organization, Friends of Merrimini Bay unique in that we, we are very holistic uh, in terms of what we do and how we approach the environment. So we do research, we do advocacy work, uh, we're a land trust, so we protect and conserve land, and we have an active education program. And I'll just run through a few slides here with a few examples of some things that we've done over the years and or are doing. Um, you know, we did a multi-year uh, current study or circulation study on the Bay, um, GPS units in these floaters, monitoring every 30 seconds where they are. Um, it's all um, um, on the web, on the website, um, animated uh, flows, pretty cool to look at. Uh, worked on invasive species, still do a little bit of that. Uh, used caged freshwater mussels for biomonitoring and to see whether mills were still discharging the dioxin or not once they changed their protocols. Have an active water quality monitoring program that's been useful in upgrading the rivers. And we still do eagle surveys and do archaeology when we have a chance. Um, strong advocacy organization, a lot of around fish passage issues. This is an eel that was killed trying to out migrate after being up on the Sebastopol River, maybe 30 years or somewhere between 30 and 50 years, uh, killed going off to spawn once in her life in the Sargasso Sea. Uh, don't have to be a big eel to have that happen. It can also, can also be a, just a little ill life or blueback herring. Worked on toxic issues over the years as well and kind of re-engaging now with some of the PFAS or forever chemical issues uh, coming out of the old air base um, and other areas, municipal solid wastewater plants into the Bay. Education has been hit hardest by COVID, but we're still getting some targeted opportunities to get into schools and work with kids. Uh, last year, a couple of great presentations outside of schools, warm October days, and planning to do that again this year. And of course, the speaker series is part of our education program as well. Uh, protected well over 1,500 acres of land by now. Mostly our focus is on prime wildlife habitat as opposed to uh, trails and so forth. And we've got three conservation easements in the works. If you missed the program tonight, or you've got someone, a friend who missed the program, or you want to go back and look at it, on our homepage down on the right under the education section, got a speaker series video list thing here, and you can click on that and you'll find a link to this in a couple of days or so. And here's our series for the year. This is our 25th year doing this, which is pretty incredible. Great speakers. And uh, if all goes well, surgery allowing, our surgery postponed. Uh, the March speaker is going to be really awesome. Uh, Mark Beckoff, he's a very, very well known uh, evolutionary biologist and uh, ethologist. He's worked with Jane Goodall and, and the likes of her uh, on animal behavior. So hopefully that'll work out well. And uh, there, and we can go over Steve's face now on the screen while I introduce him. Martha, if you want to do that. And so, yeah, so Steve Heinz, happy to have him with us tonight. He's figuring out how to get his uh, slides up to do the, uh, let's see there, the current, uh, oops, there we go. Um, so Steve earned a bachelor's degree in psychology and uh, he, he had a Navy commission from the University of Louisville, 1970, through the NROTC program. He was a uh, Naval flight officer, his career with the Navy. And he's been here after being stationed in Brunswick since 1988. First became seriously involved in conservation, doing volunteer work for um, Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, MDIFW, stream survey of Martin Stream and Turner. I have no idea where that is, Steve, in 2005. Uh, he got involved then with uh, the Trout Unlimited and spearheaded a lot of their volunteer efforts in Sebago chapter. Um, looking at uh, survey work and fish passage issues. Um, 
culminating with a couple of dam removals. So that's fantastic. Um, those were back in July of 2013. Uh, he's worked, Steve's work with the Wells National Estuarine Reserve Program to remove a third dam in Arundel, 2015, and uh, worked with Fish and Wildlife Service and a number of other groups and nonprofits uh, brought in a lot of grant money to the tune of half a million dollars or so for about five habitat restoration projects. So Steve's been awarded by IFNW for his efforts. Um, his chapters won a gold trout award for having the greatest success in conservation projects, protect and restore habitat in their area. And he continues to be active with TU on the main council as their FERC. Action Coordinator, FERC being a Federal Energy uh, um, Regulatory Commission. And he's also working with the Royal River Alliance, and he's been helpful with our efforts to upgrade the lower Androscoggin water quality. So Steve lives with his wife, Kathy, in Cumberland Foreside. They've been married 50 years, and we're really happy to have you here tonight, Steve. Even though you disappeared, people were supposed to see your mug while, while, while we were waiting, but um, you can explain the schematic and, and uh, take it from here. Thank you. Well, anyway, thanks, thanks very much for the introduction, uh, Ed, and thanks even more for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk to the group uh, this evening. I'm going to start off with a little bit of a uh, disclaimer, though. Um, just uh, wanted everyone to know that uh, really the uh, purpose of the briefing is uh, informational, and uh, please don't construe anything as uh, statements of TU policy. If I state uh, opinions, they are my own opinions and just that. So uh, something smacks of opinion, it's, it's Steve's and not necessarily TU's. So um, anyway, uh, it's important that uh, we uh, talk about the Androscoggin. Besides being one of the uh, two uh, major rivers that feeds Mary Meeting Bay, which is, the, I guess, the focus of the group. Um, it's, it's Maine's third largest river. Um, it's really, you know, a, a major, major watershed here in the state. And uh, I'll let you read the slide here for a minute to give you some metrics. And um, what we what uh, I, I think everyone you know should recognize too is that uh, the uh, part of the watershed uh, does go extend into New Hampshire. Um, then when you get uh, into the northern part up in this area, it crosses back over into Maine in the Rangeley area. What we're going to be talking about today and what we're really going to be uh, um, calling the lower river for purposes of this presentation is really just going to be the the uh, the lowest part below Lewiston Falls, but then also we're going to be talking a fair amount about the Little Androscoggin, which goes uh, a fair, fair uh, distance uh, on uh, upstate. And uh, uh, when we talk restoration, the, the starting point needs to be uh, what was there originally? What was the, uh, what was it before the uh, the, uh, in, in the pre-Columbian uh, era, pre and uh, what, what was there before we came, and we know there were Atlantic salmon now all the way up to Rumford Falls, and even in the Little Androscoggin up to uh, Snow Falls, and uh, in the Little River, we know there were river herring um, all the way in the Androscoggin up to Lewiston Falls, and that was pretty much as far as they could go. The uh, Little Andro up to Bisco Falls and uh, the Sabattis River into Sabattis Pond. Um, we could be talking about a, a number of other um, species, and they're certainly uh, important, I guess, especially American eels, because uh, they're pretty much ubiquitous in the state. Uh, whether, you know, even with dams with, uh, without fish passage, American eels, you know, a few of them, some of them still manage to uh, get upstream and uh, populate area, but uh, certainly at a reduced a rate. But uh, for purposes of this talk, we're going to be concentrating on Atlantic salmon and river herring. And uh, for most of these fish, uh, you know, runs, significant runs of fish uh, were eliminated by the 1850s. Uh, dams without effective fishways, uh, really, you know, it's, it's, it, it's a terrible, terrible, terrible thing. So um, I guess, you know, what it comes down to is if you're going to pick one thing that was uh, preventing us from restoring our, uh, 
our fisheries in the state, it would be the presence of uh, main stem dams uh, throughout the state. Um, this is kind of this. This is no longer up on the NOAA Fisheries site, but what it set up till last year was we've seen notable victories. I mean, I think everybody by now, now knows that Edwards Dam and the dams uh, on the uh, uh, Penobs on the uh, Penobscot were really the exception and not the rule. And we still have 90% of uh, dams blocking approximately 90% of the habitat uh, where we used to uh, uh, have Atlantic salmon spawning and rearing uh, habitat and. That's, uh, you know, there's steady progress. Uh, hopefully every, you know, year we, we do a little better, but as of a, about a year ago, that's pretty much where this stood. So, um, you know, besides Atlantic salmon, we'll be, you know, there, there are, we can be talking about classifications of fish and, and I kind of feel like I have to throw this slide in there because it's so confusing. Uh, we talk about diadromous fish and that's fish that, that go between uh, freshwater and in the ocean at least once. Uh, they can be uh, uh, of two types, either anadromous fish of the ones that we list there, or catad catadromous which fish, which are, which are really just American eels and uh, really, uh, um, you know, pr pretty, pretty special kind, kind of uh, creature. Um, also, just something to consider are potanadromous fish and uh, brook trout, uh, white suckers, um, these are these are, are abundant throughout the state, and uh, they need to move uh, in freshwater to to uh, access critical habitat. It's not the the great um, you know run from the uh, from the sea that we see with Atlantic salmon or alewives or these kinds of fish, but uh, certainly they have to get around to uh, get to different kinds of habitat. So uh, what kind of habitat? Spawning habitat, uh, somatids, trout, salmon, they need gravels, they need some uh, wet water coming up uh, uh, under the gravels. So there's upwelling, so the eggs can be surrounded and oxygenated. Um, they need nursery, they need uh, habitat where there's, there's rocks in, in uh, places for them to hide from uh, the larger fish that uh, predate on them. Um, they need feeding habitat where the uh, areas where they're appropriate aquatic and terrestrial insects, refugia, places when it's warm, they can find oxygen and uh, survive those kinds of uh, conditions. And also winter holding places, generally deep, deeper spots where they can uh, live during the winter. Um, we're gonna be talking a, a lot about dams and um, uh, dams are relicensed by the uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission at about a 30 to 50 year interval. And uh, unfortunately, they're not spaced out. There's no logical schedule or any you know, rhyme or reason to, to uh, when these relicensings occur. And really for about the last five years and for about the next five years, really the Northeast and especially Maine really has a lot of relicensings and everyone is just scrambling to try to uh, deal with all these adequately. Um, I'm gonna just kind of wait a second here and give you a minute to read this slide. I don't wanna leave, just uh, uh, you know, read this at you, but uh, we'll be talking about most of these dams uh, later in the project. And uh, we're really just, it, it's on the slide. I didn't see to delete it, but just to let you know, just kind of outside the scope of this, uh, this talk, Rumford Falls, that project in Rumford is also up for, uh, for relicensing currently. So I'm gonna give you a minute to read here. And I guess I'll just make one other comment is this, the Markel project there in uh, uh, Mechanics Falls, it's uh, Fish Passage uh, is supposed to be subsequent to 2027, but it's triggered by a, uh, uh, a DMR um, fisheries plan. And uh, where there's a draft plan that I'll refer to in the presentation, but not an approved plan at this time. At this time. But um, here are some of the documents that uh, you can find on the internet. I'll also have uh, some links that, uh, that will lead you to them if you're interested in, in seeing really what this, this uh, presentation is based on. Um, 
the draft fisheries management plan is really a very easy to read document that kind of in some ways I like it better than the federal document. Uh, it is just a, dra a draft, but uh, it's been been uh, prepared by some very competent people by in DMR and uh, IF and W. Um, the uh, NOAA, the NOAA uh, Androscoggin River Watershed Comprehensive Plan for diadromous fish. It's a parallel uh, uh, federal document. It is an approved document, and uh, that is also available. And uh, just something that's come out recently that has a lot of good information in it, if you want to dig and really know what's going on, is this uh, biop that was uh, just uh, issued uh, a couple months ago. And uh, this will be incorporated into uh, uh, licenses for Brunswick uh, and Lewiston Falls. But um, when we talk about the uh, the lower Androscoggin, we're uh, we're going to be talking whoops, about these these three dams, the the dams at Brunswick, Pajabscot, and uh, up at uh, Warumbo and in, uh, in uh, Lisbon Falls, and you know all told these these uh, these three projects they're 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 medium sized projects, um, they. Uh, I guess that that total uh, number listed the, the uh, 5200 the, the 52,000 kilowatts is about two thirds of the generation capability of uh, of Wyman Dam uh, alone, and uh, you'll notice that all the little dots there are green, and that's because nominally these places all have provision for upstream uh, fish passage. Problem is, none of it works very well. So we'll start by talking about Warumbo at uh, Lewiston Falls. Um, that one uh, expires in uh, uh, 2025. It's uh, early in the relicensing process. It's uh, once again, another, it's a medium sized project. The, uh, the operator is Eagle Creek Renewable. They are a, a uh, large uh, Canadian energy company. And uh, the issue there is uh, anadromous fish passage effectiveness. Uh, kind of interesting uh, going through the relicensing. Uh, the the operator kind of made got uh, FERC to uh, not conduct some studies because they they pretty much says, hey, look, we know we're going to have to change what's there as far as fish passage eventually. So uh, you know, don't don't you know, don't make us prove that it's not that good right now. We we pretty much already know that. Uh, moving downstream, uh, the next thing is the. Uh, uh, the Jebscott uh, project there uh, in Topsom, uh, you know, used to supply the mill, which has been burned, what, for 20, 20 years now, I guess. Um, the, the, this will be relicensed this year, most likely. The uh, final license application has been submitted. Um, Brookfield Renewable is, is the owner. They, you know, uh, have a, haven't changed the name of, uh, of the license, but it's really Brookfield, which is a, a huge, huge uh, 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 Canadian company that uh, has about $30 billion in assets. They, are, uh, they own right now over 80% of the nameplate hydroelectric generation capability in the state of Maine. Uh, they've been in Maine about 10 years. Um, as you probably may or may not know, uh, they're suing the state over what's happening uh, in uh, uh, their efforts to manage restoration of the uh, Kennebunk. Uh, they're also appealing a verdict on uh, the Ellsworth project by uh, Maine DEP denying their uh, water quality certification for, for that project. So uh, um, I guess in most cases, what they tend to go into these relicensing with is offering very little and any, any concessions that you get, any improvements over status quo or pretty much, uh, you know, have, have to be forced by uh, matters of law. Um, but um, anyway, just recently, uh, DMR uh, issued preliminary fish passage provisions. And uh, if, if Brookfield doesn't fight these, then, then they kind of are, are gonna be stuck with them. Uh, what, what they do is they uh, double fish passage targets and uh, they, it requires monitoring. Um, I was, you know, I was kind of surprised when I saw this, but then, you know, I think they are really going to, the, uh, the agencies are going to be dealing with this. And once again, this is my opinion. 
Um, the way the agencies appear to be dealing with this is what they want to, to happen is just monitoring of the effectiveness of the fish passage there to continue. And uh, they're, they're really going to reserve what uh, final disposition uh, for this project is for is improving fish passage until a future date. And um, I guess uh, the next one going downstream is uh, Brunswick. Um, it expires in 2029. So we're just in a couple few years before that uh, relicensing process is gonna start up again. Um, it's uh, another medium-sized project owned by uh, Brookfield entirely. Um, once again, it's an adverse fish passage effectiveness is certainly in question. A recent study uh, showed there were problems with uh, shad passage. And um, I'm going to let you read this slide. I think people recognize the picture there on the right. And uh, go ahead, and I'm going to give you a minute to just read. And um, you know, it's, it's I, I guess over the years, I've, and once again, this is a, a personal feeling and, 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 and not a policy thing, but, but it's, it's always amazed me how from time to time you'll see something in the time, you used to see things in the time record where some group uh, from overseas, a conservation room was group was shown the, the viewing room there and the, the alewives and all that. And I guess it makes a pretty picture, but, but really the uh, fishway has never uh, functioned as it was designed to function. As I understand it, it's really just a, a, a scaled down version of a West Coast design that where they really didn't take into account the actual size of the fish as much as the size of the river. And uh, it's never a, a, a functioned effectively. So um, anyway, this biological opinion, uh, it specifies some changes in the way the fishway will be operated. Um, and they've, uh, uh, when, the, when they're going to be people there to actually, uh, you know, operate the trap to uh, truck fish around, they've added a camera so they can see what's happening as far as fish and type of fish entering the, the uh, fishway. And uh, this should provide just some marginal uh, improvement to uh, how well the, the fishway functions. Um, we expect to, that the real improvement not gonna, is not going to be happening until uh, 2029 when relicensing occurs. And we really think that uh, this will, will, will drive uh, additional changes upriver. Um, yeah, I don't know the future. Uh, and uh, this is, is once again an opinion on my part, but just uh, I, I suspect that most of you are to some degree reading the paper and watching what's been happening with the uh, Kennebec uh, River dams and uh, what I think is will happen is something uh, is when Brunswick is relicensed, it'll be kind of the seminal event, kind of like the uh, um, the the uh, Shawmut relicensing has been uh, uh, for the the Lower Kennebec, and I think when that happens, we're going to see uh, other, you know, a a whole uh, a series of things start to happen. Uh, and I would suspect that uh, they will, instead of just have an environmental assessment for the Brunswick relicensing, what the, what the uh, agencies will want to do and will force will be an environmental impact statement, which will holistically look at the whole three dams and, uh, and see what they can do. Uh, the thing is, uh, this lower river, it's all uh, critical Atlantic salmon habitat. And uh, it's there, there. it is supposed to be treated specially and it's going to drive uh, some change. So uh, that's that's those lower three dams. So we're gonna gonna go on upstream here a little bit and just kind of briefly touch on Lewiston Falls. Uh, this was the limit to river herring going upstream. It, uh, Atlantic salmon were able to pass these falls and get all the way up to the base of uh, Rumford Falls upstream. Um, Fish passage above this, other than eels, which is being addressed uh, in the, the Lewiston Falls relicensing, um, it's, it's really, uh, it, no, nobody really has a good idea on how to fix this. With the big mess, uh, with uh, Gulf, Gulf Island Pond and just, just the, 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 you know, just the whole situation, no one has any good ideas that I, I've been able to, 
to uh, determine on uh, how to go forward with this. So really what happens upstream is not really addressed uh, by these uh, fishery management plans. Um, the issues with the Lewiston Falls relicensings are gonna be uh, uh, the, the uh, scenic flows. They generally, uh, since, since they did put in the Mon Monte station there to generate power using water that normally would have gone through the industrial canal and gone to Bates Mill and those kinds of places, um, uh, they used to water the dam a, a much at a much greater interval uh, than what it's watered. I'm sorry, water the falls at a much greater interval. Um, you know, we certainly would like to see the falls watered because of the uh, both the uh, scenic aspects of it, but also because of the ox oxygenation and it does, does have some effect. Uh, that would have some effect on water quality. And I'm sure I'm not going to steal any of uh, Ed's thunder and go into uh, the issues uh, with. Uh, upgrading the water quality of uh, the lower river from uh, class water quality classification uh, C to B. But um, anyway, the biop did talk about uh, uh, flows from the project potentially uh, uh, causing problem downstream. Uh, I think that's a minor concern, but at least it, it did address that. Um, just uh, just other, other things to think about, uh, you know, is or really, is this upgrade. Um, I'm just going to let you read the slide. Once again, I'm not going to talk much about this. If Ed hadn't fill, filled everyone uh, uh, with, with the information, you need to understand what's going on uh, with this by now. I'd be totally amazed, so I won't bore you. But uh, anyway, before we, we, we move on here, just uh, the real issues are effectiveness of upstream and downstream fish passage, especially Brunswick. And once again, I think Brunswick is gonna to prove to be the real, uh, uh, you know, that relicensing will be the seminal event. And that's really what's gonna get things started if, if it, for uh, restoration efforts. Um, NGO engagement, engagement is improving, both uh, the Friends of Mary, Mary Meeting Bay, Grow Ella plus a work group and, uh, uh, TU chapter, Mary Meeting Bay TU chapter. So, you know, we still need more involvement and support of uh, efforts in the relicensing process. Some of the feeders to the lower river, though, we're going to talk some about those. Uh, Sabatis Pond is uh, fed by the Sabatis River, which comes into the uh, lower Androscoggin uh, at Lewiston Falls uh, below I'm sorry, above Warumbo Dam. And uh, it is one of the sites where river herring from uh, Brunswick are, tracked, are trucked and uh, stocked into. It's big enough, it's a big enough pond that it does have a large production potential, almost uh, half a million fish. And uh, what DMR is working on is trying to provide uh, swim, free swim connectivity uh, to Sabatis Pond to the, from the main stem of the Andro. And um, as you can see, I'm not going to dwell a whole lot on on all of these slides. If you go, uh, if you look here, we're we're going up the Sabatis River, and uh, as you'll see, we do have a number of of different dams before we do get to Sabatis Pond. Uh, near term, uh, we've all one of the dams has already been removed, and uh, that was back in 2019. We've got. Uh, uh, some, some more uh, dams on the uh, schedule to be uh, 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 removed in the next couple of years. Uh, the person I just, who, whose name I did want to mention is uh, a guy, uh, Casey Clark, who I guess has been with uh, um, the main department of uh, marine resources for, the, for a few years. And just if anyone encounters and interacts with him, he is just aces. He's the, be he's the best thing that's happened to the DMR, in my, in my opinion, in, in a while. He, he is the, the, everything you, 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 you want to see from civil service. And uh, please, if, uh, if you ever encounter him, please, please give him your best. He's, he's certainly doing a great job, with, especially with this project. But uh, there are some longer term uh, uh, issues. There's, there's more dams to be removed and one of them's problematic, this 40 year dam. Um, but still, I think there will be a work around if they can't get the dam out, um, then at least I th they should be able to get a fishway. So that's uh, what we're looking for. And hopefully by about 2025 or so, we'll have uh, free swim passage from the main stem of the Andro uh, into the Sabatis River. The other resource there in this section of the river is the Little River. And um, it's kind of interesting, this was, 
I can remember years ago when I first, I guess even six or seven years ago, I really didn't really realize that there was this kind of restoration potential with the Androscog. And, and uh, John Burroughs of the Atlantic uh, Salmon Federation mentioned uh, the Little River to me and Atlantic salmon habitat, spawning habitat. And I was really kind of shocked and amazed. And then the next year, this uh, draft uh, fisheries management plan came out and I read that and I thought, boy, I feel really, really stupid that all this was, was happening and I was unaware of it. Um, but the Little River is just a small river that, uh, that comes off the main stem just uh, below Warumbo Dam on the North Bank. And um, I was able to, uh, uh, two years ago during the fall, go with uh, um, Jen Noel, who's one of the uh, marine biologists who works for DMR, and we did some kind of some spot survey work to try to find some uh, salmon reds in the Little River. And although we saw some, you know, plausible habitat, we didn't see any reds. But what was interesting is while we were there, we bumped into a local um, who was uh, in his truck trying to scout some deer there off of one of the roads. And uh, we just kind of, you know, engaged him and he actually owned frontage further uh, downstream from where we were, where he said he had seen some onids that were, you know, over, over two and a half feet long. And uh, I guess there's some vague possibility they were overgrown brown trout, but uh, another like, likely and more likely explanation is they were salmon that had passed, uh, had been passed through the uh, fish lift there at Brunswick and in, in the fish ladder and made and continued uh, upstream. So um, this is something in uh, hopefully in the in the future, the DMR will be able to do a comprehensive spawning habitat survey. And uh, there may be some volunteer opportunities there uh, that uh, some of uh, you folks might be able to uh, get involved with in a hands on kind of way, but uh, def definitely uh, worth would be a, a good experience. Nothing better than a, a day in the field with uh, one of the uh, state biologists, uh, fisheries biologists, because it's they're, they're a wealth of knowledge. It's amazing what all they know. We'll next go on to the Little Androscoggin. Um, sadly, none of the seven dams in the main stem um, have any uh, provisions for fish passage right now. That's your, the picture is of the lowest dam there, the Lower Barker's Dam, which is uh, in Auburn, just very close to the confluence uh, of the Little Andro with the uh, main stem Andro. And uh, it's really uh, has to be a, a restoration effort uh, emphasis. It's kind of ironic for reasons I've never gotten what I thought was a reasonable explanation. It's not designated critical Atlantic ham, say, ham and Atlantic salmon habitat, but uh, that's where all the spawning habitat is and uh, certainly a good percentage of the uh, shad and blueback herring habitat. And um, the alewife habitat, uh, I'll let you read those, uh, all the different waters that, uh, that are, are uh, connected to the little Androscoggin. Um, the, you know, those do have a, a, a major, major potential for uh, alewife spawning. Um, what, what really gets you about this waterhead is all these dams are just worthless. Um, you know, these, these dams can all be replaced by solar farms less than two acres in, in, in size. Uh, you know, in, in one case, Hackett Mills, uh, which is one of the smallest uh, uh, facility, you know, hydro, licensed hydro facilities in the state, they could, they could put a solar farm on the existing footprint of the facility and, and generate as much power in the course of the year. But uh, this combined, you know, 42, 45 kilowatt cap generation capability is just a drop in the button bucket. It's it's really it's it's nothing. It's you know it 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 it's really it. Th there is no way that there is any balance between the good this could possibly do and the environmental damage which the presence of these dams causes. Uh, these most of these dams are owned by a company called uh, KEI, and um, they are. Uh, uh, really, oh, they're uh, Kruger Energy, uh, and they are for a, another Canadian company. They're in Maine. They've got about a dozen projects, and uh, all of them are these just small projects that are really worthless and, and would be so just, they, they just need to be gone. But uh, as you can see, there's a number of dams on the, the, uh, the uh, Little Androscoggin. 
Uh, besides lower barkers, we've got upper barkers, which is in relicensing right now, and that's uh, uh, about a half a mile upstream. There's a breach dam, which, which shows, uh, we don't have the, the name doesn't show, but it's a little field dam, which is breached. You go up to Hackett Mills, which is a small project, Markel in Mechanics Falls, Welshville, and got a success story I'll be sharing you about with you about that here shortly. But uh, Lower Barkers, um, over a year ago, uh, it was re the relicensing uh, was occurred. It's, it's really just going on a year to year basis right now, but the uh, water quali quality certificate called for 1.7 million alewives uh, fish passage capability and, uh, in, and uh, drastically increased minimum flows. The owner appealed this to the uh, to the main board of environmental protection, and like I said, and like the slide says, on anything they could think of is how what they appealed it on the basis of, and it's pending resolution. But it looks like after you know over over a year of extensions, they they finally are ready to announce something. Um, timing of this briefing was just ended up being a little little uh, uh, early, but uh, there should be a settlement more uh, announced. Uh, next month, which will drive what happens in the rest of the Little Androscoggin. Um, it, it looks pretty certain because only last week uh, on the first FERC docket, the uh, request for a trial type hearing, which is how um, KEI would fight these uh, prescriptions uh, that was withdrawn by them last week. So I'd expect in, you know, by, by the end of this next month, we will know the fate of the fish passage on the uh, uh, little uh, Androscoggin River. Um, I don't know what that's going to be. If I, you know, there's some possibility that it's going to also be tied to what happens at Brunswick at Brunswick downstream. So um, anyway, besides that, uh, the, the lower uh, barkers, we've got uh, upper barkers. That's right now they're doing this, doing some studies on uh, for uh, data uh, that will inform the relicensing process. Hackett Mills also in relicensing, uh, waiting on reports there too. Those reports are late. Um, it's going to be interesting because when you get these dry these dry years, some of the studies, uh, you know, your data is going to end up being kind of questionable. So uh, uh, NOAA Fisheries is pinged on uh, the owner, and this it's uh, th that Hackett Mills is actually owned by uh, Eagle Creek, who also owns uh, Rurumbo and. Uh, NOAA Fisheries is pinged on them, but we haven't heard anything back uh, on that. Some other dams, Markel, um, uh, it's the next dam above Hackett Mills. And I guess the, the fish, the, 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 their, their current license says fish passage by 2027, but that's conditioned on the uh, fisheries management plan. And so far that fisheries management plan is only a draft. So uh, something's gonna have to happen uh, there. Uh, Littlefield Dam, um, that's the one that's that's already breached, but we do have it. But it needs to go. When you have a breached, even a breach dam, which probably will fit, will pass fish under, under many conditions. It still stops sediment flow. Besides water going downstream, you also need to have rocks, sediments, uh, sand, those types of things, and uh, its presence, you know, does damage the watershed. It's also so two very small dams. Uh, uh, further upstream, uh, those are, you know, by the time we get to those, it's going to be probably 15 or 20 years, I would guess. But uh, a success story is if anyone is driven by, uh, you know, past uh, Oxford on Route 26 and going north, if you look on your right, you've seen this uh, Welshville Dam. Um, it's really kind of fallen apart. And uh, the tan it does uh, have some effect on water levels of some uh, ponds with a lot of camps on them, which are uh, fed by a, a feeder from the Little Androscoggin about a half a mile upstream. But um, uh, the, uh, t the town has now decided instead of trying to rebuild this dam that they're going to uh, 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 control the, the grades at the outlet of the ponds. And that will uh, essentially make this dam uh, just something that probably they will just let wash away. And that's a good thing. But uh, it's key to restoration of alewives and Atlantic salmon. Um, so much of the alewife ponds uh, are upstream of there. And uh, 
I, I can remember, I guess, a few years ago going to a, a meeting of the a Royal River Alliance, and uh, we were giving a presentation. And I told people that it was was uh, a, was very clear from the historical record that there were once Atlantic salmon, you know, in the Royal River. And I can remember the the look on this one woman's face, like you know, like, are you nuts? But it's you know, it's it's very clear from the historical record, and the same is very true for for the uh, Little Androscoggin. I'll let you read this slide, uh, but but essentially, that you know, there there is Atlantic salmon habitat there that's hasn't been used for 150 years. And, but it does look, uh, uh, you know, like the, the potential is there and we are working to reconnect that. Uh, besides this uh, habitat up uh, uh, above what, between West Paris and uh, South Paris, then we also, there's a Brog, Bog Brook in Minot, which is a cold water feeder. And there's possibly other cold feeder brooks which go into the uh, Little Androscoggin. But uh, uh, you know those could provide some additional in Atlantic salmon habitat uh, as well. Uh, as far as alewife breeding habitat, uh, if you've ever been to uh, the, the uh, town hall at Oxford, very close to there, you can see where uh, uh, the, the outlet to Thompson Lake is. And I truly believe that once upon a time there were river herring, there are alewives uh, breeding there. Um, if we can reconnect this, uh, you, you, it could produce up to a million alewives. Certainly concerns by camp owners in uh, DMR on um, you know, what would happen to the uh, Atlant landlocked salmon fishery. Uh, currently, they eat uh, the smelt that are there. Um, you know, would they eat the uh, alewives or, or not? It's, it's, you know, I guess uh, IF&W would need to study that. And all I can say is that, that for warm water fish, I've had some of the best you know, summer warm water fishing here locally uh, in two lakes where they do put alewives. Uh, those are um, Sabanis Pond and in, um, uh, what's the other lake, uh, Taylor Pond in Auburn. So uh, I know at least for bass and pike and those fish, they certainly, uh, you know, do, do thrive with the alewives, but uh, there would be some concern and probably some study required for uh, reconnecting at Thompson Lake. So, uh, the future of restoration, what's it dependent on? Um, I think one of the things is, is something that's been a major focus of this group is the upgrade of uh, water quality classification. I certainly hope that uh, that happens in this legislative session. Uh, settlement for uh, Lower Barker's Dam and the entire uh, uh, Little Landerscoggin watershed, uh, something should happen next month. And then uh, what may be tied to this and really the whole watershed would be the uh, Brunswick uh, terms and conditions and we'll see that in February of 2029. So what can you do? Um, love the Androscoggin. I, I, you know, I when I was first up here in the early 70s and lived in Topsom, it was a mess. I can remember the pink soap suds at the base of the fall at the uh, base of the of the uh, of the dam in Brunswick uh, in August in the in the in the stink in the from from, from the uh, polluted water, but uh, we need to. It's not that way anymore, and we need uh, for folks to tell our legislators to support the legislation to upgrade water quality classification of the Lower Andro. Uh, I, there isn't an LD number assigned, or I'd tell you what it was, but it's coming. And uh, please, you know, get behind this with your legislators. Uh, support the Friends of Mary Meeting Bay. They continue to do good work. Support Meeting Bay, Meeting Bay TU efforts. And uh, once again, hopefully we'll have a volunteer component to a uh, future Little River Spawning Habitat Survey. Uh, support the, the, the uh, Auburn Conservation Commission uh, efforts to remove the uh, Littlefield Dam. Boy, they got some hard going with the politics there in Auburn, I'm, I'm sure. And um, the guy who is uh, the uh, Conservation Commission chair is, is a uh, young young man named uh, Sam Boss, who's affiliated with uh, Bates College. Uh, if, if, if anybody can make it happen, I think Sam can. So uh, if you can support that and talk that up to your friends in Auburn and uh, Lewiston, uh, that would be helpful. Um, also, um, you are able to comment on these relicensings directly. Uh, using a quick comment uh, software function on the FERC site. Um, that's the link to it. If anyone uh, ever wants to comment on any of these uh, processes, you, you can do it. And uh, I'd be happy to help you uh, do that when should the time come. 
But uh, uh, to you, our mission is, uh, as stated, just uh, would like to kind of introduce uh, Charlie uh, Spees of uh, Mary Meaning Bay TU. He's also a uh, uh, Friends of uh, Mary Meaning Bay uh, member, and that's his email. Uh, he is going to be uh, uh, you know, watching what's going on with the relicensing actions for those lower three dams. Uh, this presentation, you know, went further than uh, than uh, he he is uh, his his coverage area, but uh, he will be involved uh, with with the future of the relicensing. Um, just about done. I would just like to say that that uh, we've still got about another month of uh, winter left, at least. If you read one more book this winter, please read Running Silver. Um, it's, if, if any of what I've said today resonates with you to any degree and you wanna explore it more and understand it better, read this book. John Waldman is fabulous. Uh, he, you know, he does have specific name references to uh, places in Maine. And in fact, I, I, I bumped into him fly fishing up in Greenville uh, this past summer. Good guy. It's a good book. Uh, please read it. Uh, these other ones are good as well. If you have, if uh, you've already read that one. But uh, there's some wa some uh, ways to get to the source documents, which most of this uh, presentation was based on. Here's my email. Uh, please, you know, get in touch with me if you'd like to uh, explore any of this further. And that's it. I'm. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I'm open to questions. Well, thank you. Thank you, Steve. That was awesome. Um, so really appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> while Martha's looking at questions, I'll just mention that um, in terms of Atlantic salmon restoration, the Androscoggin River is part of the Mer what, what the feds call the Mary Meeting Bay uh, Shrew Salmon Habitat Rearing Units. Uh, and, and that includes the Androscoggin, the Kennebec, and the Sheepscot. And what's it, very unfortunate in my mind is that while there's a goal of restoration goal in the in that area, I think it's like 500 reproducing pairs of salmon. Um, it doesn't really matter where they come from, and all the energy really has been going into the Kennebec. So, as someone who's someone who wants to see more attention paid to the andro, um, you know, as as probably most people on this call know, the more diversity within a species we have, the healthier that species will be, and so. Um, you know, those fish on the Andro are going to be a little bit different than those on the Kennebec, which will be a good thing. So uh, hopefully, you know, some of the points that you've raised in your presentation will will resonate with a lot of people on, on, the, on the call here and, and uh, serve to motivate a little more enthusiasm for the Andro and restoring it as part of this bigger uh, Marymeen Bay watershed. So, thanks, Steve. So yeah, Martha, are you, Martha, are you looking at questions there? So there, there was a question from Kay. From, from Kathy Clare about the quote there. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. So that your your slide, Steve, about the with the quote on the shad inefficiencies in Brunswick, that didn't have an attribution to it. Do you remember where which report that was from? Or was it from Jean Lichter or uh, no, that's 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 from the study that was that was done by uh, some by uh, some folks from UMO. And I, if it's not Hmm. I, th I thought I, I thought I had attribution there on the slide. We can we can I can go back to it if you want if you want me to dig through the slides. But well, uh, wasn't wasn't on the slide. And I know John Lichter and, and students at Bowdoin had video cameras out there and were counting and so forth. And um, some maybe some more work's been done since then. I don't know. But um, anyway, um, question was who where was the quote from? So. Yeah, it was it was from from a you know a published paper by uh, by a group of. Uh, of uh, research scientists from uh, UMO. Okay. That is for questions, Martha. Yep, that's it for questions. Usually it takes a while for people to soak in and decide on what they want to ask. Well, it's, a, it's a lot of information and, you know, and maybe too much. It's, uh, if, that, if that's the case, I apologize, but uh, it's, there's, there's there's just so much there and, and the, the amazing thing is having said all that you still feel like you haven't even scratched the surface i, I had a question steve um i think um if i recall correctly there was a FERC number project number associated with bisco falls but your slide said FERC exempt what does that mean well what 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 FERC exempt means is that 
this project doesn't have to go to through uh, um, periodic relicensings. Uh, once again, these these projects are relicensed on thirty to fifty year cycles. Um, once a, a project is designated exempt, and it's 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 smaller projects. I forget what the exact kilowatt uh, capacity is. Then they don't have to be pre, uh, uh, periodically relicensed and relooked at. Um, you know, there's a oh, what is it? There's there's only about 20 or so, pro less than 20 projects in Maine, and they're being and uh, they're kind of dropping out because once again, small projects really aren't you know, aren't profitable and just the regulatory burden on small projects is just so, so, so amazing uh, that the, uh, the, a number of people are just getting out, getting out of hydro. That's kind of what's happened with the, well, let's say the, the Mousen project was licensed, but it was, uh, you know, very small project in uh, the, the, the uh, Kennebec, uh, Kennebunk Light and Power District just got pretty much, they never said they this was the reason, but you could tell they just wanted out. It was just too much of a hassle for too few kilowatts, and uh, um, the um, uh, that that's that's a um, an exempt project, so it doesn't come up for relicensing. It does have terms and conditions of operation of operations attached. Uh, just in my experience, if you take a look at any of these projects that are exempted. Probably about half of them, if you really look hard, you'll find that they're really not living up to what they're supposed to be doing. They're so small and, you know, it, it's it's only uh, exceptionally like for, say, the uh, the uh, oh, the Royal River, where that was an exempt pro was an exempt project uh, where, where someone decides to take them on and go after the exemption and, and get them and shut them down. So uh, anyway, I hope that answers, answers your question. That's a good one. Does anybody have any other ones? Yeah, we have Brian in the lineup on the stack and then an Ellen is next. So Brian, you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question? Sure. I am uh, curious as to uh, how stiff is the opposition to removing these dams? That's a good question, and it you know it, it, it tends to vary. I think you know what what you find is is, is if you get a, a, a small main town with with a with a, a dam on it, uh, it could be their their biggest uh, source single source of uh, property tax. So uh, I think if anyone who's following what's happening with the Lower Kennebec's realizing that that's that's part of what uh, some of the object objections are to removing those uh, four lower dams is would be they'd lose the uh, property tax valuations for for any dams that are are removed as well as other other uh, uh, disadvantages. Um, I think that uh, you know one of the reasons why it's great to have people like Charlie all you know working and uh, looking at Brunswick is is the day will come when uh, it's going to be an issue when, when Brunswick comes up for relicensing. And what you, what you hope is that things like the Brunswick uh, uh, Conservation Committee and the town of Topsom and these kinds of entities will get behind the removal and, and you know, or the uh, great improvement to fish passage for those dams. Um, Brookfield organized the, um, or, or was, is a participant in uh, the uh, uh, Kennebec uh, River Alliance, which is a group that's uh, trying to, to uh, uh, oppose the removal of the lower Kennebec dams. And what you're afraid of is, is the same thing would happen on the lower Androscoggin. And if we have, you know, people uh, in the towns uh, saying, you know, we're, we're willing to do this for the environment and not just trying to nickel dime over what uh, what they're getting for an assessment. I, I, I know one thing that Brookfield does tend to do too is to go to the towns and try to lowball their assessments. And uh, it certainly appears that, uh, that what they do is they tell their investors this dam is worth one thing and then they tell the turn around and tell the town it's worth something else. So mm -hmm. uh, um, you know those, those are the those are the kinds of things which I think drive opposition that well that and I don't know, I guess a certain a certain am amount mainers of a certain age associate, uh, you know, hydro operations is, is um, you know, it, with with prosperity and jobs, uh, uh, you know, hydro is renewable, but it's not clean and it's certainly not green. And you can ask any trout or or any of those uh, diadromous fish that we, we showed on the slides there. So um, and anyway, I guess that's does that answer your question? Yes, and I knew, and I thought it was interesting. You said one of the dams could be replaced with just two acres of solar panels. So, could that be a way for towns to recoup some of their uh, lost revenue? 
Certainly. Okay. In fact, uh, just just to, you know, you. It, it's interesting there. You know, just on uh, on the Mousum, where, where the dams are still in and they're fighting uh, license surrender uh, down there in Kennebunk, is is the town already replaced the generation capability with a, with a solar farm? Great. Okay, Ellen, you're up next, and we have one more question yeah. after that before we're done. Then that would be Vance is the last question. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Okay. I. If the Brunswick Dam isn't going to be up for relicensing until um, 2029, doesn't isn't that holding everything else up in a very bad way? No. And the other thing is, you just mentioned that hydro electricity is not clean and not green. Could you amplify a little bit on that? Sure. Um, let's see. I guess you're. Well, let's see. What was the first question again? Well, um, if if the relicensing of the Brunswick Dam isn't going to come up till 2029. Isn't that a terrific holdup of everything else? Well, I, I guess yes and no. It's, it's you know, it, you certainly would like to have all this stuff fixed, uh, uh, you know, immediately. Uh, but I think really, if, if you really look at this real uh, realistically, um, the, the state's getting squeezed for resources. They're up to their elbows trying to, to deal with the relicensing of the, uh, um, the uh, lower, lower Kennebec dams along with the, all the other projects besides this that are up for relicensing and to, to take on another major projects, you know, simultaneously, I think is, it would be beyond their capability. So, you know, my take on this, and once again, this is, this is my opinion and guess is, is that uh, uh, what will happen is, is when they resolve the lower Kennebec dams issues, then, then the, the focus shifts and you look in what in the next thing that's up next, one of the major things that's up next will be the, the, uh, the Androscoggin. And I think, you know, from a resource of protection, you know, uh, you know, aspects, that's how that will go. And uh, let's see, your, your second question was, why isn't hydro green? And clean, it's, yeah. I mean, you know, we've got all this business about CMP and all this hydro electricity coming down from Canada. And you're saying, why isn't it clean? Well, and I mean, well, I, I guess, yeah, I mean, for, for, as a TU guy, I guess my primary answer to that is just ask any trout, um, you know, the, these, the, the, uh, if the, the restoration of uh, the removal and restoration of, of fish passage would be the greatest thing you could do to improve the environment. The dams themselves, uh, you know, uh, the, they raise water temperatures in the impoundments, they lower oxygen in levels in the impoundments. They uh, promote uh, the uh, um, abundance of uh, non-native in invasive species such as bass and pike, uh, those those kind those kinds of things. And uh, the, the uh, I guess you know one of the things people don't realize too is 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 alewives and eels and these things when they come up from the ocean they bring nutri nutrients with them. Um, it's not as drastic a process as is say Pacific salmon on the uh, the, the west coast. But still, um, there's just so much fecundity, so much, so much fertility that's being lost from the lower parts of these watersheds because we don't we don't get the interaction with uh, with with the uh, saltwater uh, species that were listed on that uh, that slide that I showed early in the presentation. So, you know, those th those are you know are, 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 are I think some of some of the prime prime reasons. Vance, you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Go ahead, Vance. We see you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Is it something he can type into the into the text box, into a chat box? Yeah. So what he's got is, what do you think is the most critical dam removal battle to win that would generate momentum for further efforts? Wow, that's a hmm. What's the most cool? Yeah, that that I guess that's a hard one. Um, you know, when dam relicensing occurs, what happens is it's really kind of a, of a two-part process. The, the FERC process is, is the visible process, but then there's also the 401 water, uh, uh, water quality certification process. And, um, you know, just so often uh, 
FERC, and once again, sp speaking in, you know, is, is a Steve Hines opinion, uh, anything with commission on the end of it tends to be supportive of the uh, industry it's supposed to regulate. And uh, FERC, you know, in my experience, is, is too often and too lopsidedly uh, sided with hydro interests and not uh, rather than trying to balance hydro interests with uh, environmental and other uh, aesthetic and other kinds of concerns. Um, so, uh, you know, so often in, when, uh, when uh, these uh, licenses, when there are uh, terms and conditions applied to licenses uh, that, that do have good consequences, uh, they come out of uh, 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 the main department of uh, environmental protection uh, because the, the, uh, the projects aren't meeting the uh, water quality certification requirements. You know, that having been said, Edwards Dam, as I understand it, and I guess Greg, if Greg Pott's still on the call, he can correct me because I think he knows this better than I do. But as I understand it, the exception would be Edwards Dam when FERC actually refused to relicense the project because it was just so devoid of, of value. So anyway, those does that answer your question? Yes, Mike isn't working. So we'll go on to one last question. Um, he did answer in the chat that it answers this question. Um, we have Jim as a, maybe the final question. Jim, are you in queue? Yes, yes I am. Thank you. I, I'm new to this. Uh, Ed, uh, one of those uh, new people on the, on the show today. But can you take a minute and just explain what design? I've looked at that fish ladder in Brunswick. What design for a fish ladder would work, would be effective, and, and how high can it go? I looked at the kayaker near Baxter Falls. That would require a, a great deal of structure the way the Brunswick Dam was built. So what would you suggest they do? Um, that's to be, you know, I, that, that's, that's beyond my expertise. There's a, there's, there, there are, you know, a few people I can direct you to, uh, you know, in, in New England, one of whom is a, a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service employee who are experts in uh, fishway design. Uh, it's very complicated. The, the science involved is uh, nonlinear, which means that uh, you make a, a, a small you know, difference could have a great effect on uh, what, what the final uh, uh, result is going to be. Um, the, um, you know, it, what, what, you, what, you all, what you're looking for is, is an alternative to these fish passages, uh, you know, to these, uh, these, these uh, you know, constructed fishways or nature-like passages where you have series of rock ramp kinds of structures that uh, that more resemble a, uh, a natural fish passage but uh, you know as, as far as how to design that it's it's very it's very complex okay. engineering and it's in 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 once in in too often uh once that engineering has been affected and and uh the, the fish passage is installed it doesn't work okay. and, uh, even when it's even when it's in i would simply come and support the woman who spoke and said if you don't fix the brunswick one you're not going to get much getting a chance upstream to play with the other ones. So it is a it's a big problem. Thank you for presenting this. I this is a story that I was unfamiliar with. My pleasure. Okay. Uh, okay. We so are finished it. with our questions. Ed, do you have a few last words? Yeah. Well, thanks again, Steve. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Martha. Um, I, I'll point out to um to Ellen, uh, who asked the question about clean, clean and green. If you haven't seen it, you might want to go back on the website and look at our first presentation from this season on mega dams and mega problems. And, and Steve is talking about smaller dams tonight, generally, where the problems are typically fish oriented, but there are huge climate change issues associated with the really large dams that uh, are the type that Hydro-Quebec uses um, and marine fisheries issues with those as well. And uh, Jim, I'd be happy to talk to you about fish passengers design. It is quite a complicated issue. And there's a number of, um, number of ways to do it. I'll also point out that Brunswick originally, um, part of the issue with Brunswick is that um, um, the design of the dam was changed after the fishway design was approved and uh, or the turbine placement was changed. Mm -hmm. And so one of the big problems is that the entrance to the fishway right now is immediately adjacent to turbine one and fish need an attraction flow to go up whether it's into a fish ladder or a lift and if the attraction flow is confused by an adjacent turbine hard to know where the you know hard to know how to get up so. all right thank you